think we can go. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Please turn off your phones. Please fill out the feedback form at the end. My name is Frank Lance. This talk is just my own thoughts and doesn't necessarily reflect the opinions of my employer or anyone else. Um, and this is the topic of my talk. I'm uh, going to speak about life and death in middle pair. The overall context for this talk is that uh, video games have changed our conception of games forever. I mean, we've always had games, and uh, they've always been an important part of our lives. But since the intersection of computers and games, our interest in games and the energy and attention that we devote to making and playing them is uh, really off the charts. And, um, and so now games are poised to become the most important art form of the 21st century. Um, I feel like this meme is already slightly played out. Is, uh, is Miguel Seacart here? Miguel on Twitter just the other day was saying, I'm officially no longer interested in this topic. And uh, he may be right, but let's indulge ourselves uh, for a little while longer because it's important to think big and it's important to follow through on your, your big ideas and your big thoughts. And this is kind of, kind of our big idea. Um, so what does this mean? I feel like there are um, a couple of ways forward, uh, a couple of paths forward in, uh, in living up to this potential. Um, we can make games that are more widespread, more accessible, and um, we can make games that are more for grown-ups, more games that are deep and profound and meaningful and important. And both of these things really require thinking about what games actually are under the hood. And to my mind, there is still a lot of confusion out there about what type of things games actually are. Um, I really only have one idea. And um, so this talk is kind of about the same thing I always talk about when I talk about games. And that one idea is that games are something like music, literature, film. Um, games can be meaningful, beautiful, in the way that uh, these other things are. But their meaning and beauty is actually quite different. They have their own very peculiar way of being beautiful. And understanding this particular kind of beauty is, uh, is challenging, and it's important. Because um, if this is, in fact, the golden age of games, then uh, we, game developers, are its custodians and architects and inventors and guides. And we should understand the peculiar way that these things are beautiful in order to reach more people and in order to make a deeper, more valuable games. So this talk is about the peculiar beauty of games through the lens of two games that I personally find very, very inspirational. Go and poker. So let's start with Go. Um, the origins of Go uh, are somewhat uh, ambiguous. Um, it was possibly created by this guy, the Chinese emperor Yao, uh, who lived around 2500 BC um, and maybe asked his uh, counselor, Counselor Shun, to, um, to invent a game to be a good influence uh, for his uh, uh, unruly son, Dan Zhu. Um, and in ancient China, the game was actually called Wei Qi. It's called uh, Wei Qi in China. And, um, and Wei Qi was considered one of the four cultivated arts of the Chinese scholar gentleman, along with calligraphy, painting, uh, learning the musical instrument uh, Kuchin, um, these were considered uh, skills that you needed to know and be able to practice. Um, it was introduced uh, into Korea, uh, where it's called Baduk, uh, around uh, the 5th or 6th century, in Japan, uh, around the same time, where it's called Go. And in Japan, it became a really important part of uh, imperial court culture. Um, in the 13th century, uh, it became started to become kind of popular in the general population, and four competing schools of Go were developed uh, during the Edo period, it's in the 1600s or the 1800s, roughly. Um, and during this period, a, a, a series of castle games were played in the presence of the shogun. This was like an important central part of, uh, of, of the, uh, the imperial culture of Japan at this time. And then it uh, started to spread to the rest of the world in the early 20th century. 
and, uh, you know, sort of be played all over the place. I, I discovered the game um, when I was much, much younger, and uh, I discovered the game really through discovering the materials for the game, the board and the pieces, which I uh, found in my um, father-in-law's uh, house. And, you know, he had the board and the pieces and play, had played a little bit casually. And I played with my friend, a guy named Brian Del Vecchio, and we... Um, just had the kind of the barest understanding of the, the basic rules of the game. Um, and we kind of bootstrapped our way by just playing through uh, how to, you know, to understanding the game a little bit deeper. Um, and the, um, the, the, the materials of Go, the, the board and the pieces, are themselves quite beautiful and they're quite seductive. And uh, they drew us in and the ideas are quite simple. And because of that, the game is really good kind of at teaching itself to you. And so we... You played in this very clumsy, awkward way and then slowly kind of, you know, rediscovered some of the basic principles of the game. And then we got interested in, uh, picked up literature and started learning and studying uh, in a more serious way. Um, but, you know, to begin with, we just encountered these these basic, simple rules that we understood, that it's, it's played on a grid, um, black and white, uh, take turns, placing stones on the intersection points of the grid, and uh, the object of the game is to surround space uh, with your stones. You're trying to surround territory and capture territory. Um, and the, the sort of key rule is about capturing, that um, whenever a, a stone is uh, surrounded by stones of the other color, then it's captured. So the, the little lines leading out of the intersection that, that your stone is sitting on are called liberties. And uh, if white here places a fourth stone, removes that last liberty of that black stone, then white captures black. And that's sort of like the engine at the heart of, uh, of, of Go. This also is true of groups. You can capture a group of stones in the same way. Um, and it would happen like this. You place a stone there, and then white captures all those stones. Um, so as a result of these rules, a, a group that looks like this, that has what, two internal liberties, what we call eyes, um, can't be captured. And so that's a, that's a living group, and that's settled, and we know that can't be captured. And so the... Um, the idea of life and death is, is uh, the fact that groups of stones on the go board are always, uh, you know, in, in a position of either being settled and guaranteed to be alive or uh, ambiguous and they could possibly be captured. Um, so a typical game of go unfolds, you know, a little bit uh, like this in the sense of, uh, you know, the two players are surrounding territory and they're kind of dodging and weaving around each other and they're fighting for, for life and death or more often avoiding fights, kind of threatening to start a fight and fainting and, and, and uh, then leaning back and settling. And, and, um, and, you know, that's occasionally a full-blown life or death fight breaks out and, uh, and might have a huge impact on the outcome of the game. So I want to talk a little bit about the themes of Go. Sometimes it seems like in an abstract game like Go, it really isn't about anything but itself. But uh, for me, Go is rich with themes. Um, to begin with, I would say like one of the fundamental themes of Go is the idea of emergence. Um, so this is the John Conway's Game of Life. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this, the cellular automata. Um, and the basic idea of simple rules in an iterated system producing deep, complex, surprising, and unpredictable behavior over time. Um, so this is a, a pattern called a breeder, which actually, as it moves across uh, the, the grid in, in life space, leaves behind it uh, uh, little glider guns. It's an amazing, beautiful pattern. Um, and this fundamental idea of starting with simplicity, a handful of simple rules, and having them unfold into an explosion of, of complexity and depth um, is really at the heart of the game. Uh, John Conway himself, fascinating guy. I mean, the, the, the game of life was first, when he first thought of it, uh, was played out on a Go board with Go pieces. So there's a deep connection there as well. Um, another theme, an important theme of Go is the, the tension between local and global. Um, and in some ways, this is a particular strand of the idea of emergence. So what happens in Go is you're Constantly in situations, if you look at maybe the lower right-hand corner of this board, um, there's a local situation happening. There's a fight brewing. And there's going to be a, maybe a life-or-death battle for those two groups. And so the, the, the move that you make there has a really large tactical influence on the outcome of that situation in the corner. But the move you make there also reverberates out and has a very subtle influence on stones that are a little bit further out, and it has a very, very faint but real influence on every single stone on the board. And so that what is a, a sword strike 
in one corner of the board is a butterfly wing in the opposite corner. And this works because the players are squeezing maximum efficiency out of every stone. And therefore, every situation on the board is poised on a, on a nice edge between possible outcomes. And so the whole apparatus uh, of a Go game trembles with hypersensitivity to the power of each stone. Um, another theme that comes up in Go is um, the tension between profit and potential. Um, so you're constantly judging uh, between making a move that secures territory and guarantees you some points, um, and uh, you know, which is the ultimate goal of the game, and um, a move that increases your power and position and will allow you to take uh, more points later on. Um, and in, so you're you're always looking at this. You're always uh, uh, considering your move uh, in terms of its immediate. Uh, effect and its immediate meaning um, in terms of acquiring points and its potential uh, down the road. Um, there's another important concept in Go that is called shape. And um, shape is an attempt to capture a lot of subtle information about the difference between good and bad plays in kind of rules of thumb, heuristics. Um, so you have uh, in shape, you have light versus heavy, light shapes versus heavy shapes, moves that are light versus moves that are heavy. Um, and uh, and in, in, light, in, this, in this pairing, light is better than heavy. You want to be light and you don't want to be heavy. What light means is uh, a move that's flexible, um, that has a lot of potential meanings, right? Um, it could be a move uh, that you're willing to sacrifice. You play a move that's a potential attack, and then when your opponent uh, defends, you just let that stone go. You let him swallow it up and you move somewhere else. Um, so that's a light move, a, a move that's flexible. You're not overcommitting to a single direction. Um, and then there's another uh, uh, pair of, of terms, which is thick versus thin. Um, thick is a move that is solid and dependable and, uh, and certain. And thin is a, is a, is a shape that is, that is weak. Um, so uh, a, a thick move and a, and a thin move, a thick shape and a thin shape, the thick shape is something you can rely on. It's solid, it's powerful. You can then just like be comfortable in your knowledge that that shape is settled and you can then use that power and that confidence to make uh, light moves uh, elsewhere on the board. So this is, it's, this is really tricky. Like th light is good. And thin is bad, right? Heavy is bad, but thick is, is good. Um, and um, this is why, this is one of the reasons, like, this is a good kind of example of why computers are not as good as humans uh, yet at, uh, at the game of Go. Um, that it, you know, the ability to, to compress uh, so much information into these, uh, into these kind of mental patterns, this dense uh, uh, clot of meaning uh, that's so subtle and ambiguous and contradictory. Um, this is, a, you know, a, a human characteristic of, of the highest order. And this is one of the things that we enjoy when we play Go. Part of its beauty is our awareness of this subtle cognitive process of compressed meaning. Um, another important theme in Go is the idea of flow, the, the concept of direction of play. The stones, although they do not move, they have momentum. Um, and uh, there seems to be like a natural direction of, of play as, as the stones unfold. It's almost as if uh, they're they, they don't move. I mean, unlike chess, where the pieces are moving around, the, the stones are just there, and yet they feel like they're alive. You feel the kind of energy buzzing off of them when you play. Um, and, uh, and, and this, this feeling is also an important part of the, of, uh, the experience of the game. Um, another theme is, is the idea that every game of Go plays out like a conversation um, in which one player is, you know, saying, oh, look, I think this situation over here is most important. Boom. That's what they mean with that, with that move. And then their opponent says, no, I think this situation is more important. And they might play in a different part of the board. And then the first guy says, well, no, you forgot about this. And then the other guy says, well, no, you forgot about this. And then they say, oh, that, that doesn't look, that doesn't work. See, you overlooked this. And they say, no, actually, it does work. And then they move here. So they're, they're really... You know, each move is kind of a claim about the universe, a claim about this uh, tiny toy universe. Um, and um, uh, so, like in the in the famous game that uh, that Clint talked about earlier between Katani and Shusai in, in his talk, um, he really brought this idea out that these people were talking. Um, now, in my you know in 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 
Shusai's view that, uh, you know, Katani's move was BM, bad mannered, as we would say in the StarCraft uh, community, uh, because, you know, he was kind of exploiting this little hiccup, you know, in the protocol uh, of the game. Um, but, uh, you know, I gotta be with Katani on that one. I mean, he was squeezing every possible advantage uh, out of the game, and he was searching for the best possible move. Um, and so I think that he was, uh, he was Gosu, uh, uh, in StarCraft terms, or Tasuji, um, in, uh, in Go terms. Because this is really, this dialogue that's happening between these players is a dialogue in pursuit of truth. Um, you know, there's room for personal style and, and self-expression in this process, but, but it, the conversation revolves around truth, around facts. There are things that we can say with certainty about situations in Go, in a, in a game of Go. And, and the dialogue between the players revolves around those things. Um, it's an entanglement between the two minds of the people playing but between their two minds and the world. Um, so if games are an art form, they're an art form with, with truth in it in a very strange and interesting way. Um, I often think of this scene from uh, Waking Life, the, the Linklater movie, in which uh, Kaveh Zahidi is, is talking about the French film uh, theoretician André Bazin and his, uh, his ideas about, about film. And, and one of the things that, that Bazin uh, things about film is that the, one of the important things about it is that, like in photography, you open up the, the 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 lens and the thing that's in front of the camera is captured for a second. And that thing is real; it's true. So unlike literature, in which you're telling a story, or a midget walked into a bar, and and that works as a story because your mind has these kind of abstract, overlapping concepts. When you film that, you're looking at a particular midget in a particular bar. You're looking at a concrete slice of the actual world. And for Bazin, who was a, a Christian, this was like the sacred moment uh, in, 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 because you're, you're just face to face with the world, and that means being face to face with God. And so for him, you know, film was, had at its heart this kind of like sacred moment of, 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 of truth, of reality. Um, and I think that, that uh, games kind of like uh, have, have, a, have a similar but, but completely different relationship to truth in that way. Um, so all of these things combine together to create another overall theme of Go, which is that Go is about thinking. Go is thought made visible to itself. Uh, the game of Go illustrates emergence with these simple, discrete moves within a, a completely deterministic system that, that lead to surprisingly deep and complex situations. But also in Go, you trace out that emergence with your thoughts. Uh, in Go, you must, when you study Go, you must just learn to read. And it's painful and dull. You just read every situation. Black, white, black, white. Black goes here, then white goes here. It's reading out a ladder. Black goes here, trying to capture white. What can he do? White goes here, then black goes here, then white goes here, then black goes here. It's like lifting bricks. Um, but you also must rely on your ability to, to see, as from a distance, the patterns that cannot be articulated in this discrete and finite way. The truly high-level play is about intuition and feel and wisdom, as well as this brute strength, tactical reading. So Go is something like a, a brightly colored dye that is squirted into the fluid of our thoughts just at the point where they unfold into turbulence, at the threshold between these two ways of seeing, the discrete and the continuous. And we set up camp at the border of what it is possible for our minds to compute, and then we push into the wilderness. And human thought itself is like this. It's simple units operating according to deterministic logic that aggregate into incalculable subtlety and complexity. And so Go is therefore two ways of looking at thought. It is, it is a lens uh, through which we look at thought itself. We're observing our own cognitive functions, and also a model looking at thought as, as a subject. This process of thinking, about thinking, of uh, contemplating thought is, is, is kind of a form of meditation. And Go has, for a long time, been considered by many to be a martial art. Um, and, uh, and, and as a martial art, it really is kind of a spiritual discipline. Um, this is reflected in the, in the culture of Go. Um, and... Um, just, you know, and just so you don't think that I'm, you know, that it's all sweetness and light and I'm kind of romanticizing this, I actually think that one of the ways that, that Go works as meditation is that 
it's a machine that you inject into your mind and it expands to fill your mind until there's no room left for you in your own head. Um, in this sense, it's very, it's actually quite destructive. It's a form of self-destruction. Um, you know, there's a famous uh, story uh, saying about chess. If you want to destroy uh, a promising young man, you teach him how to play chess. And, and of course, the, the same is, is true of Go. And I'm sure many lives have been destroyed. Uh, by chess and by Go, as, as they have by uh, by other games. Um, so Go is at least partly escapism. It's escapism of a, of a sort. Um, you know, thought is painful. Our minds are full of the endless chatter of consciousness, and Go is like a, a single note, uh, a, a sound created by striking this tiny corner of the universe, and it reverberates forever, and it fills your head with something that's like silence. So let's talk about poker. Um, the origins of poker are also somewhat ambiguous. Um, several precursor card games led into it, but the essential form of what we call p- poker is, seems to have evolved uh, in the early to mid-18th century uh, in America. So um, the same time as these uh, castle games were being performed for the, for the shogun, uh, the game of poker was being invented up and down the Mississippi River. Uh, with the invention of the uh, card cam uh, recently, I guess about 20 years ago or 25 years ago, uh, poker became a hit as televised spectator sport, um, which fueled a sort of golden age, which we're currently kind of in the, t- in the tail, we're kind of riding out the tail of the golden age of poker. It's fun to be in, uh, alive during the golden age of a game. Um, Texas Hold'em is the most widely uh, played, uh, most popular version right now, but really uh, most different versions of poker share enough characteristics that uh, I'm just going to talk about poker as a whole. Um, like many people, I played poker my whole life, and um, I really never thought much about it. Um, I thought it was basically just a pure luck game. And uh, until about, I guess, 10 years ago, uh, when I discovered that it is a game of skill, that some people study poker the way that you study Go or the way that you study chess, and you get good at it. Um, and um, this really appealed to me. Uh, this, you know, There was something perverse about it that I really liked, this idea that there was this game that had maxed out on both skill and luck, um, and it seemed kind of sneaky that you could study poker and get good at it and beat other people. Um, I really liked that idea, so I got into it. Um, one of the things that happened to me uh, early on in, in um, starting to, to play poker a little more seriously, I was over at a friend's house, a, a programmer named Greg Ecker, and uh, he was playing poker online, and it came to the river, and um, his opponent, uh, you know, bet, and Greg called, uh, and, uh, and Greg was beat. And Greg said, well, that's okay, um, I win there most of the time. And I said, what do you mean? I, I don't understand. What, what, is it, what do you mean? You didn't you win there. Mo- you just made a move and you lost. And how does it, what does it mean that you win there most of the time? Um, uh, it was such a strange, uh, counterintuitive idea to me. The idea that he, you know, he made a move and then, and then he lost. He, you know, um, he lost the game because of this move. And then he said, yeah, I'm happy with that move. That was a good move. I was, uh, you know, because I win there most of the time. Um, it was so interesting and it created this little hook that uh, drew me uh, deeper and deeper into the game of poker. Um, I started studying poker and learning uh, the basic strategic concepts, uh, the idea, the important ideas of hand selection, you know, choosing which hands you're going to play and which hands you're going to sit out, uh, the importance of aggression, uh, how powerful and important it is to sort of take control of a hand that you're in and uh, determine its uh, momentum and um, and the incredible power of position. So in poker, uh, the, the players uh, take turns and there's a different order in which the actions uh, happen and it's very powerful to, to act last because poker is a game of hidden information. Knowing what your opponents are going to do, having that uh, ability to choose after they have chosen is incredibly power powerful. So uh, uh, having, having position on someone is, is incredibly good. Uh, the art of hand reading, being able to look at your opponent's behavior and reverse engineer a likely range of, of hands that, that, uh, that they might have, a likely range of cards that they might be holding. Um, pot odds, the idea that everything you do uh, in a hand of poker is, is you know, trying to, uh, ha- has the potential payoff of the, the chips that are currently in the middle of the table, and that you're calculating this. Uh, you're also calculating implied odds, the, the, you know, the chances that if you hit your hand, there might be more chips that you could get out of your opponent. And then the reverse implied odds, the fact that even if you win, you might, you know, get sucked out on, and then there's, 
there's polarized ranges and there's merged ranges and there's Slansky's fundamental theorem of poker and there's Morton's theorem and, and it goes on and on and on. So there's a lot of important, deep, interesting strategic concepts. But I want to talk more about the themes of poker in the same way I talked about the themes of Go. Um, so to begin with, this idea of expected value, which is what my friend Greg Ecker was really talking about when he said, I win there most of the time. Um, in poker, the idea of expected value is called EV, and you talk about it all the time. When you start studying poker, uh, you realize that it's a game in which you're just constantly trying to maximize your EV. Um, and what that means is that at any given moment, uh, with all the, the hidden information uh, that is not available to you in a hand, um, you have to look at the range of possibilities and how the possible actions that you're choosing from affect uh, and result uh, in outcomes across that entire range, and you weight those things, and then you choose your action based on that. And as a result, it's very bad in poker. When you start studying poker, one of the, the worst things you can do is be results-oriented. You say to someone when you're, when you're studying with them, uh, oh yeah, so please don't be so results-oriented. Um, that means that they're too focused on the outcome of a particular hand. And they're not thinking enough about the expected value, about the range of possibilities, uh, given the hidden information and everything that you do know. Um, and so, in some ways, this is a... It's similar to the tension between local and global in Go. Because both of these are ways of seeing past what's right in front of your eyes, past the sort of immediate present environment, to larger meanings, larger larger effects, um, and the ability to, to understand uh, the, the relationship between the now and the, the larger spread of time is like being understand the, the relationship between uh, the local tactical situation in a game of Go and everything that's happening across the entire board. Um, another important uh, theme in, in poker is uh, the idea of emotional self-control and patience. Um, there's a term in poker that I'm sure everyone is familiar with called tilt. Uh, and tilt happens all the time, because uh, tilt is the, the negative uh, uh, anxiety and, and, and anger and uh, emotional bad feelings that you feel uh, when you've been unlucky. And poker is designed to put you into situations where you get unlucky over and over and over again. So in the short term of poker, there's this constant temptation to just give yourself over to rage and frustration and despair. And Poker sort of demands that you develop a form of emotional self-control by shoving you down and stepping on your face. Um, and so if you want to play poker well and you want to get better at poker, you have to learn how to stand back up and gain control over your emotions and rein in those negative feelings. Um, this this feeling, this, this kind of these bad feelings in poker, um, if poker was a meal, uh, this sense of unfairness is really one of its main ingredients. Um, you, you know, you can't talk about the beauty of poker without talking about this, these kinds of uh, uh, negative, negative emotions. And in fact, um, there's a great quote from Phil Ivey. This is a picture of Phil Ivey. Many consider to be the greatest living poker player. Um, and um, he said once, this is just on a televised poker shows, Poker After Dark or something like that. It was just part of the chatter at the table. Um, he was talking to some other people. And he said, you know when you lose so much money you can't breathe? I like that. That's what I'm addicted to. And um, I just love that so much. And it was such an over... Like, when I... It was like an epiphany when I, when I heard him say that. Um, the greatest living poker player, uh, who's also just a degenerate gambler, um, and the, the truth is that the beauty of poker has a lot of pain in it. Um, and I think this is true of a, of a lot of games. Uh, and I think it gets passed over a lot. I think this is something that is often left out of the discussion when we talk about the fun of games. Um, and we often just kind of like slip into this way of thinking about games as, um, as pleasure-dispensing appliances. Or how can we make them pump out the fun a little bit better, pump out these positive uh, emotional uh, feelings a little bit better. Um, but there's something abject and, and, and dark and self-destructive in poker. 
Um, you know, poker is also a machine that you inject into your mind, and it expands out to fill it up and and get rid of the the noisy person that that lives there, pacing back and forth, muttering to himself about his job and his responsibilities and his girlfriend. And um, so there is something, I think, dark. Um, even even though I, I find poker to be very deep and beautiful um, and and elevated, um, I have to acknowledge that there's something dark there as well. Um, it's, I want to just talk briefly about uh, this guy, John von Neumann, Johnny von Neumann, who's an important uh, scientist in the 20th century, um, mathematician and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and physicist. Um, and the origins of game theory are really rooted in uh, von Neumann's interest in the game of poker, in looking at poker and uh, wanting to understand it, wanting to analyze it. Um, because poker is about mutual decision-making under uncertain conditions. And so uh, the, the field of game theory, which went on to be an important field uh, and, and continues to be an important way of looking at the world, looking at mathematics and economics, international relations, um, really has its roots in von Neumann's interest in, in looking at, at poker and understanding what it means to, to make uh, simultaneous decisions in a confusing situation where you're not quite sure. Um, and out of game theory uh, came the, uh, the strategic concept of mutually assured destruction, which is one of the sort of keystones of, of, the, of nuclear deterrence, of one strategy of nuclear deterrence. So during the Cold War, uh, one of the ways in which we uh, set out to avoid the possibility of... Uh, of, of total global thermonuclear destruction of, of the world uh, was was by thinking about concepts uh, that are rooted in game theory in in this analysis of, of poker, um, and so I just think that it's cute. I think it's adorable that maybe there's a small percentage chance it's quite possible. This is not like a silly poetic thought. It's quite possible that in a really concrete way, poker helped save the world. Maybe right? Poker might have saved the world. Um, and I think that's kind of nice. <laughs> and because poker involves simultaneous decision-making between multiple agents with partial information, it makes for a much more interesting artificial intelligence problem than something like Go or chess. Uh, a game like Go, uh, whether it is solved or not, you can understand what it means to solve it. And in fact, it's quite obviously solvable. Um, and, uh, but poker really makes you question the definition of what it means to solve a game. So I have no doubt that either now or very soon, something like uh, two-player head-up uh, hold'em will be solved in the sense that you will, will be able to articulate a strategy that you cannot do better than even against, an unexploitable strategy, that anyone using this strategy, there's no way you can beat them. But that's not really the goal of poker. The goal of poker is to maximize your edge against whomever you are playing. Um, you want to be playing in ways that take maximum advantage of the ways in which your opponent's strategy deviates from this theoretical optimal strategy. And the strategies that take advantage of your opponent's mistakes are themselves non-optimal. They are themselves, in fact, exploitable. So what you're really doing when you play poker is this dance where, where you are trying to accurately locate where your opponent is in donkey space and adjust to that. And he's doing the same thing to you. So it's a dance through the, the chaotic paths of donkey space, uh, using uh, social perception and social judgment to understand where you are and where he is and constantly adjust around each other in this dance. And that's a very human thing. That's yomi. That's empathy. Um, and that's not something that is likely to be solved by a computer anytime soon. And this dance is one of the beautiful things about poker. And so, like Go, the AI problem in poker is not just a tangential issue. It's one of the aesthetic features of the game. It's one of the things you enjoy about poker, is your own awareness of your own brain trying to solve this problem. And I haven't even talked about money yet. So, um, obviously, money is a big issue in poker. Poker uh, is about money. Um, it's about making money. Um, and so you have these, these themes of gambling and addiction and the morality 
of, of your actions in a game uh, that are very present in poker. Um, and my view of this is that poker is a good example of the, of the alchemical uh, transformative power of games. Um, I think that greed is to poker what violence is to football. Um, football transforms violence through this alchemical process into something like ballet. And poker transforms greed into something like poetry. And the thing is that we live our lives subject to money and to greed. And poker is, is, a, is a very strange ritual in which we, we both amplify these things uh, and also dissolve them. In poker, our own greed becomes present to us in a, in a very intense way. And all of these things combine to create another overall theme of poker, which is that, like Go, poker is another form of thought made visible to itself. Um, in the standard model of, of uh, quantum mechanics, individual particles can be in a state where they are not in any particular place at all. Uh, instead, they are sort of smeared out in a kind of cloud of possible locations, each of which is more or less likely. And, and this is how poker trains you to see the cards in your opponent's hands as a cloud of possibilities. And eventually, you start to see this all around you. Um, studying poker changes your perception of, of cause and effect, of information and noise, of randomness and order. And you start to see the world as a set of overlapping probability clouds. You begin to embrace uncertainty as a, as a new kind of knowledge. And you come face to face with, with basically with, with Bayesian logic, which is the, the logic of, of probability. And really, Bayesian logic is the, the logic of science. It is how we understand this process by which we look at evidence and then move from that evidence to, to knowledge, to confidence about a claim about the universe. This is not a simple thing. I mean, this is the scientific process. You look at evidence, and then you, based on that evidence, you, you have a theory about how the world works. You have, a, you have a, a knowledge, belief about how the world works. But it's not obvious how, like, okay, how do I do that process? How do I start from evidence and end up with belief? To, to how much belief should I get out of, a, out of a, a, how much evidence, and so, so on and so forth. Poker, by carving out a tiny little corner of the world, allows you to drill deep into this question and confront Bayesian logic uh, in this toy universe in a striking and powerful way. And the thing is that poker is, is, is not just about learning about this stuff, but it's about the process of changing the way you think. You're, the, 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 part of the beauty of poker is, a, is, is looking at your own mind as it wraps itself around the, these, these ideas. And, this, and, 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 and you're doing this for its own sake. You're not doing this to make, to, to become a better scientist or, politician or doctor, but to just get at a particular kind of beauty in thinking itself. Poker is a sculpture that is carved out of our thoughts and emotions and decisions and the world, the truth of numbers and randomness. Poker is a form of behavioral psychology that we apply to ourselves. So all this discussion about behavioral psychology in games, so many of the deepest, most beautiful games are forms of behavioral psychology in which the player is both the, the, the subject and the, the researcher. So when you look for leaks in your game, um, in poker, you're looking for leaks in your thinking, in your beliefs, in your behavior, in your decisions, in your emotions, in your cognitive process. As in Go, this process revolves around the truth, the search for truth, for knowledge, and for understanding. And in Go, we saw the emergence of intuition and knowledge from discrete deterministic units of thought. Poker builds up meaning out of noise, long-term truths out of capricious fate. It's like a particle accelerator for, for cause and effect and knowledge and belief, smashing them into each other in order to reveal the secrets about what they're made out of. And like Go, poker is a way of getting at a hard-to-understand truth. And like Go, poker is both a laboratory of thought and a model for thought. So here are our two masterpieces, um, the two games I spent the most time studying seriously and playing deeply, and they're very much alike, but in many ways they're incredibly different. Um, Go is this austere, exotic, mystical, beloved icon of game design snobs. And poker is this tacky American pop culture junk food sleaze buffet. Um, Go is a game for gentlemen scholars. And poker is a game for cowboys and nerds, for stockbrokers and frat boys. 
And this is more than just a cultural cliche. When you play Go, you really feel the game itself pulling you towards the smart end of the pool. And, and the opposite happens in poker. Poker wants you to drown in the shallow end, staring up through the beer cans and the cigarette butts at the cold, indifferent stars. <laughs> but, but like Go, poker can be approached as a spiritual discipline. As a martial art. It isn't common, but it can be done. And if you approach it seriously, poker invites you to treat it as a martial art. Um, there are some people who take this approach. Uh, for example, this guy, Tommy Angelo. This book, Elements of Poker, is a good example of this. Um, these are the, this is the way I tried to play poker and failed. But these are the rules that I tried and mostly failed to live by in my poker play. Think of poker as an established discipline of which you are a student. Approach the game as a student with humility. Don't just plop down in front of the computer and toss out your game and see what happens. Enter into the game as if you were entering into a sacred place. Practice your game the way that serious martial artists practice their craft, as a form of moving meditation. Respect the game, your opponents, and yourself. Embrace the proper extra game techniques like bankroll management and tilt control and results indifference, all of the away from table study, the way a martial artist embraces the established customs and rituals of his school without question and learn to breathe. And Go may be more beautiful, but poker has taught me more about myself and the world. And Go is, is beautiful in a Newtonian way, but poker is a face-melting punk rock weapon of subatomic ego destruction. <laughs> poker hurt me. It punished me. It made me suffer. Poker forced me to stretch my brain around the law of large numbers, the concept of expected value. Forced me to think probabilistically, to see, to see the world as constructed not out of discrete objects and events, but out of collapsing probability clouds. To disengage my decision-making process from the deeply embedded subroutines of cause and effect, and to learn to see concrete reality in theoretical outcomes. Thinking this way is, is, is extremely counterintuitive, um, but it feels modern. It feels futuristic. It feels the way the human brain might be evolving to understand the world more accurately, more effectively. So these are some of the ways that I find these games to be beautiful. Um, but there's a larger idea here about games and beauty, about where the beauty is in games, which is that we've played Go for centuries because it is beautiful. But also, Go is beautiful because we have played it for centuries. And you can say the same thing about poker. Many of the transcendent qualities of games are expressed by their evolution over time. The institutions and discourses that emerge out of them, the communities that grow around them, the literature that bubbles up from them, their customs and language and rituals and norms, the, the, the learning and truths that they produce over time. Beauty is, is not just a property of, of a system as object, but beauty is something that we excavate from the world through the game. And designers and players are working together to construct and discover and preserve this beauty. I think that in some way game designers are like architects and we make rooms and our rooms can be more or less beautiful as architecture and there's a race of creatures that is drawn by this beauty and will sometimes occupy a room and use it for their rituals and ceremonies which themselves can be extraordinarily beautiful and sometimes these ceremonies are ridiculous and profane and sometimes they are sacred. The beauty of their rituals is deeply connected to, but not identical to, the beauty of our architecture. So what can we apply from this to our jobs as, as video game developers? Um, actually, the real question for me here is, what are the principles that we can apply to all game design, regardless of genre or, or platform or setting or materials? And I would say, to begin with, the power of abstraction. Abstraction is powerful. Um, and it can also be very appealing. Uh, Go and poker are games that grown-ups play. And one of the reasons that grown-ups play them is that they don't have so much pretend and make-believe in them. Um, so if we want more grown-ups to play our games, one way um, is to, you know, explore this powerful uh, direction of, of abstraction. It is often assumed that meaningful games must present meaningful themes. Um, and there's an assumption that the deep internal meaning of something like Go or poker is somehow 
just about itself, just about recursive navel-gazing. It's not really about the world. But music is about the ear and the heart and the pelvis. And ballet is about the human body and sex and gravity and death. And go is about the relationship between the local and the global and between immediate profit and future potential. And poker is about fate and virtue and a million other things besides. And underneath all of that, I think there is a subterranean meaning that all games share, which is they are about thought and action, about effort and result, and about cause and effect. And unlike the rest of life, which is governed by utility and goals and the tyranny of instrumental reason, games turn these things in on themselves in order to observe them, enjoy them, set them free, and escape from them. You can think about the context for your game. You can think about how your game exists in the world, about the way that people learn it, why they play it, why they want to get better. These things are not your sole responsibility, and they aren't always in your control, and they are never easy. But you can think about them and incorporate these thoughts into your design. Why can't a video game be a spiritual discipline, a martial art? Why aren't we more ambitious in this direction? Imagine a modern warfare or Halo or Dota that instead of schoolyard chaos had a bit more dojo culture bit into it. A a deep, competitive game with a culture of honor, humility, discipline, and respect. This is the kind of thing that David Serlin talks about uh, in his book, Blame to Win, uh, about the culture of fighting games. Um, this is the kind of thing that Josh Weitzkin talks about, uh, who is a, a chess prodigy, who then went on to become a, a Tai Chi, a high-level Tai Chi competitor. Um, and in fact, David Serlin, uh, kind of inspired by Josh Weitzkin, uh, claims to be able to count frames in the real world uh, when he's in, a, when he's in a, a Street Fighter tournament, which I think is a wonderful idea. <laughs> This is the kind of thing that the League of Legends guys talked about uh, yesterday, or I think, uh, when they were talking about how the design of a game can influence the character of the community that goes around it, and how what they were doing in League of Legends was intentionally trying to improve the quality of the community that built up around it, which I think is an amazing idea. I should say that I love video games that are just entertainment. I love video games that are disposable pop culture. But I also want a video game that I can teach my son, and we can play our whole lives, and he can teach his children, and they can play their whole lives. I want more video games that give me a space in which to entangle my mind with the mysterious, infinite secrets of the universe. And this doesn't have to be precious. Poker proves that you can have something vulgar and violent and dirty and shameful and dangerous and addictive And if it's deep enough, it can slingshot you all the way around to new orbits of insight and higher levels of consciousness. I actually don't want to suggest to people what kind of games they should make and play. I think telling people what kind of games they should make and play is like looking at a mountain and looking at the top of the mountain and saying, get under my feet. Um, I just want to get people to think more about this aspect of games, this facet of their peculiar beauty. So... Try to leave a little space for the infinite in every room that you make and every room that you enter. Start small by keeping this in mind when you make and play games, and I will too. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> what? Is that what you're supposed to say? <laughs> yes. Hi, Frank. So in the, in the sort of, um, you talked about uh, in poker how uh, it had these, uh, the, you know, this great poker star guy had these powerful, dark, heavy, negative feelings, right? Yeah. Um, about losing money and bankruptcy, like these kinds of, these kinds of feelings that normal people um, are really terrified of just because of the stress of financial life, right? Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, there's also, you know, sort of, you know, uh, the apocryphal examples of people addicted to Warcraft or whatever you want to say, right? Like people who suffer, yeah. um, you know, uh, compulsion loops and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I, so what I wanted to ask is, do you think there are um, a certain class of negative feeling that for some reason is more attractive to players than, like, I, I don't know, I can't think of very many games that are successful because they're deeply sad, but I can think of lots of games that are successful because they're deeply cruel or, or the bankrupt you. And is it just about, is it just about compulsion loops and grinding and... No, I mean, I, I think that this, um, you know, there are many different flavors of pain uh, that we enjoy right, so, tasting, sorry, yeah, right? And my question and that is, we enjoy... why are some of them successful and some of them not? No, I mean, ingre ingredients, there's no unsuccessful ingredient. Okay. These things are, I think, just ingredients. Okay. And sometimes they, they fit together and produce a, a great cocktail or a great opera. And sometimes they, they go together and they just fall flat. Okay. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think there are, you know, particular negative emotions that are better than others for, you know, for trying to build something beautiful out of. Yeah. Um, I just think, like anything else, you, you try. And, and you see what happens. Okay. Thanks. Uh, one of the features of poker that I find the most interesting is that the more you have at stake, the better the game is. Yeah. If you're just playing for matches, then it's, it actually stops being poker and it's just glorifying coin tossing. You're always going to stay in a hand. You're always going to play it to the yeah. end. Yeah, although many people, I mean, millions of people play, play money poker. Yes, bizarre. So, I mean, it, there's still something there, but yes. But I agree with you. I don't play play money poker. No, no. In fact, yeah. it, it, it almost becomes pointless to play anything other than just about the level yeah. that you're going to not end up in as a kind of a Phil Ivy yeah. and stop breathing. But um, isn't there a danger that the trend in video games now where you lose less and less? So if you get shot in um, Medal of Honor or Call of Duty, you you respawn or you regenerate automatically. Your save um, positions are much more frequent. It's much easier to save. Yeah. But all these kind of ways in which video games become easier to play for that reason, one is detracting from the game itself. So if I'm getting yeah. into a room, I don't even need to think about where the, 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 the kill's going to come from. I'll just go in and shoot, and if I get shot, then I'll know next yeah. time how to do it. Well, we're, I, we're I think... We're losing something. Yes, yes. I, I, I see what you're saying, and, and I think um, it's very true. And I think, you know, games are about meaningful choice and meaningful action. Um, and so you're always looking to turn up the dial on, on the stakes, if you, you know, the importance of why it matters, whether you do this or that. Um, and uh, so some games, uh, you know, establish a context for the outcome of, of the match that uh, just amplifies that, that sense and makes, you, makes the mind keener and focuses you in on what you're doing because it matters. Um, because you care about beating your sister, you know, because you want to prove that you're smarter than your sister, or because there's money on, you know, on the line. Um, and in video games, um, I think we often uh, dial, turn that dial up with uh, theme and context and story. Um, that that's, you know, be because many video games don't have the external context of, of why it might matter, um, then you say, well, you're, you're saving the universe, or, or, you know, that, so it's just another way of, of, of turning up the dial, um, and, um, but I think there are many ways of, of turning up this dial, and I think they're all legitimate, um, and, uh, and sometimes it's fun to turn the dial all the way down, and it's like, do something where it doesn't matter, and there's a pleasure there as well, <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks, Frank. Uh, hey. On the topic of uh, games having a heritage or a game where you, you know, there's a culture that builds out of it because of a long, uh, mm -hmm. you know, generations playing it. Uh, I want to hear more about your thoughts on how that pertains to video games because they're so inherently temporal because software and hardware changes. More thoughts on what? Uh, on how that pertains to video games oh, because okay. they're so temporal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's some essence of heritage in genres and games that borrow from one another. But yeah. like you were saying with the legal, of the legend, League of Legends example, right. um, the design is so, you know, so closely related to how it affects how the players play that yeah. just small changes can, can do that. So as Sure. No, that's a super good question. And I'm, I'm really hoping, um, I don't think there is, but I was really hoping that there would be a talk from the Blizzard guys uh, this year at GDC about kind of that issue, about the transition from, from Brood War to StarCraft II and that, that the way that they had to handle both of these, uh, these issues. They have to treat, you know, they have a, a piece of software that's a product 
um, that needs to come out kind of seasonally in a way. And then they also have this culture that they've built up that it, where there is a game that kind of transcends that that thing as a product, and it is it is just a game in the world the way that Go is almost. Like StarCraft is is one of the great examples of a game that is kind of in that transition. Uh, Street Fighter too. But look at the way that Street Fighter and StarCraft evolve. They, they manage to handle this this issue. Um, and in some ways, you know, physical games have to deal with obsolescence as well, and, and they have to evolve and change and grow. Uh, you know, poker has to do that too, you know, like, we might be at the tail end of Hold'em. People, maybe Omaha, right? What about a little uh, pot limit Omaha, right? I mean, that, they're, like, these, the, I think these issues apply um, in, in both cases um, if, if, you know, if you're looking to solve those problems. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks, Fred. So we were talking about, you were talking about um, sort of games as a meditative practice almost, and, and when you talk about Go with your friend, yeah. you know, you guys are kind of clumsily stumbling through this game, and it strikes me a lot of the time that, and I think we see this a lot as developers, that, that the game is often just a framework for the real game, which is the learning of the game. Um, and there's almost like this higher derivative of, of your learning is the game. Um, and, and what I was going to ask is, you know, now we have games that, that make it possible to have incredibly complex rule systems and things like that. And one that comes to mind is Dwarf Fortress. Yeah. And you've got a situation where the, ga- the playing of the game is actually just the process of learning the rules and understanding what the rules are in the first place in a lot of ways and just knowing how the system is going to respond to different kinds of feedback. Mm-hmm. And I was just going to ask you if, if that is a possible route for, like, you're talking about kind of this dojo practice of playing a game, if there's, if there's a mechanism in that type of a game where the complexity, the depth, the difficulty, and the frustration can actually be a mechanism for that type of meditative practice of gaming. Yes, and I think this happens all the time. I think, um, you know, uh, yeah, Dwarf Fortress is a great example. One of the pleasures of Dwarf Fortress is, is the passing through the threshold of looking at a screen that is just a garbled mess of, of ASCII, and then the process of, like, learning how to interpret that and see it. Um, but that's not the only pleasure of, of Dwarf Fortress, right? There's lots of other types of, of pleasures, too. And it's, um, but, but it is, yeah, it's, it's, it's l- learning, you know. I mean, that's, that's the, the Raph Koster's, uh, you know, insight into, into fun and the, the theory of fun is that that's basically what it is. And I'm kind of saying a similar thing, right? Um, although I don't really think of it just as, as learning because learning is, in fact, well, you learn something in order to do something else. Mm-hmm. Well, this is just using your brain for its own sake, <laughs> Like you have to use your brain all day to do other crap, and then sometimes you get to just like swim in your own brain, and that's you know, and that's that process. But I see, you, yeah, I think you see this in a lot of of art games as well, like Jason Rohr's work, where you know you you're like part of the, the designed experience is the way in which the the player is encountering encountering the, the different mechanics and learning them and incorporating them into into their understanding. You know, cool. yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. So you you mentioned that you failed as a poker player, and I assumed from the way you were referring to it that you didn't mean you failed in a financial sense. So I'm oh, curious no. if you could. Oh no! Yes, far from it. <laughs> yes. So could you could you give right? me like the the, the, yeah. the the meditative and sort of like the the, the studenthood perspective that you approach these games from? Could yeah. You, could you talk about that more, like what it meant to you to, to fail? Well, first of all, I was just being modest. I am a truly I'm an ascended Zen master of poker. No, I I mean, I yeah, it's hard. Like it's so hard. Like, when I, I'll, honestly, I'm just a degenerate gambler. When I sit down to play poker, it's usually because I want to, like, get drunk and f- bob like a cork on the sea of poker as the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, um, and then occasionally I'll get a glimpse of what it means to actually do this. So it's kind of like advice, you know, that I really believe in, that I would like to be able to apply to myself um, uh, and, and other people. Um, you know, and... and you know, like, like I said, Go is actually much better, but it has had longer to develop these, uh, these kind of rituals of, of, of respect and, and, and learning and humility um, and seriousness and study. Uh, and, and poker is much more, like, raucous and noisy and, and um, distracting. Uh, but I do, you know, I just, I just think that it's a worthwhile thing to, to swing at, even when, when you're going to miss. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, one more question, and then I think we have to go. Uh, hey, Frank, Kirk hey. Kohler, a uh, long-time Thank listener, first time Thank caller. you. Um, you talked kind of uh, about how uh, playing poker uh, and, and playing it and learning it and really 
uh, understanding it, uh, sort of trained you to learn in a way, or trained you to view the world in a way that it was sort of made up of probability and yeah. collapsing clouds. Have you uh, found that that has affected your uh, the way you approach game design in any concrete way, or um, and has it improved your? Yeah, no, I mean a little bit. It's it's hard to to you know I don't apply it like an actual technique, um, but it just creeps up on you. You start to think in terms of yeah design decisions and things. You start to think more l- less about what's right and wrong and more about what is going to maximize your. Uh, your potential payoff. Uh, and so, I, yeah, I think that that's, it can be a valuable thing to, to apply to the design process itself. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thanks, everybody. Yay.